Hello everyone and welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the horror programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, I'm the head of the horror programme which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. We'll be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. The University of the Underground is a free pluralistic transnational university founded in 2017 and birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. So we're non-profit, uh, we're a registered charity. So if you'd like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org. On this website, you can find loads of other exciting program times and events. And you can also find amazing lectures, much like this one from, that we're gonna have from Jackie Knight on our Instagram page. So Jackie Knight uh, is a Marie Curie ITM Research Fellow with the Cognition Institute and Doctoral Researcher in Trans Technology Research at Plymouth University. As a media theorist and practitioner, her research retrofits an understanding of photography as a manifestation of human engagement with matter in order to address photography's changing ontology in technological photographic practices. She's currently le um, she is currently lead researcher for TAACT, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Jackie, <laughs> which is a collaborative research project between Digital Horizon at Torbay and South Devon NHS Foundation Trust and Trans Technology Research that aims to develop alternative and holistic approaches to medical care by reviewing the tools, methodologies, and approaches um, in the teaching and training of healthcare professionals. So she's previously held lecturing po posts in critical theory, film, and fine art across various institutions, including Cardiff Metropolitan University, Plymouth University, and University of Falmouth. As co-founder of Artist Film Lab, Cine Star based in Cornwall, she's been dedicated in supporting creative work with analog film through exper experimental workshops, screening events and education. Uh, she has exhibited and curated numerous film screening events and group exhibitions internationally and has had solo shows at places like Nancy Victor Gallery in London. So yeah, this is an amazing bio, Jackie. <laughs> got such a, a like eclectic list of things that you're doing. So uh, thank oh, you yeah, so much for joining us. Oh, uh, that's okay. That's fine. Sorry, I actually realised I was about two years out of date. <laughs> oh no. Okay, I hope that's I haven't read the wrong one. one. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much for um, for inviting me because uh, looking over the program of University of the uh, Underground, it just looks uh, quite an amazing program. Actually, sort of very eclectic, which really suits my my kind of interests. Um, but uh, yeah, I, um. I, so I've been asked to give you a talk about my work and also give you some guidance how to form research questions. Um, and so I thought maybe the best way to do that was to kind of integrate both, um, to give you some examples of how I've done this throughout my PhD practice, but all, also how I've taken um, I've taken this beyond my research and uh, and applied it into practical and quite consequential real world settings in forensics and medical simulation and um, uh, yeah many other kind of uh, uh, scenario uh, 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 discipline areas. Um, so I, I probably should start by explaining that Ag and I were research fellows on um, the Marie Curie um, PhD programme here in Plymouth. And um, it was quite an exceptional PhD programme in that there's 25 researchers from different disciplines and we were brought together to look at different aspects of creativity and cognition. I think this is probably where I should try attempting to share screen. Um, presentation. Okay, so can everybody see that? Should I? Uh, everybody can see that? Yeah, perfect. perfect. Okay, um, so I come from um, an experimental film work background um, and in which I've kind of looked at a range of analog and digital cameras um, and I've made, um, I've used a, a, a various analog and digital cameras to make various sort of documentary film works. Um, and the works that I made 
during my PhD ran alongside my research around different kinds of distributed and extended um, and situated cognition because we were all we were all sort of brought together to look at um, cognition and creativity, different aspects of that through our own disciplines. Um, and so what I was particularly interested in was looking at um, the ways this was more, this was work during this time. Um, so this was looking at the way human cognition is enmeshed with other people, tools, technologies, and the environment. And in particular, I really like to use analog cameras um, particularly 16 mil film over digital because it gives me more agency um, over um, over all the aspects really of the image production um, and and this concern um, became an important problem for my thesis when I was helped to um, I, I, I was kind of asked during my thesis to do lots of different types of filming um, these are some of my experimental film works. Um, I'll just flick through them. This was the wall of death. So I, I went to film the wall of death. I got into the middle of the wall of death and um, there's this kind of flicker effect as you, as you sort of track around the pole in the middle and you look up and the circus tent is creating this kind of flicker effect, which really sort of simulates the zoetrope on early, um, as an early filmmaking device um, so this film really sort of it did lots of different things it sort of really kind of challenged how your cognitive your perceptual apparatus and cognitive apparatus apparatus sort of puts images together so tracking this lady on this motorbike going around the wall of death with this flicker effect going on behind um, was quite interesting um, this was, uh, I was invited to um, film some bell ringers. Um, the bell ringers, uh, they do this thing called the ring of changes where they have this book and they have to follow this mathematical um, kind of diagrams to work out um, the pattern which they ring the bells and how they kind of work that between each other is that they're, they're always looking at each other as a cue to when they're gonna pull the bells. So I was kind of, interested in that um, co-relationship between them, how they, you know, they're anticipating when to pull and, and giving each other sort of nods and cues. And um, this was, uh, we have a big Olympic pool here. Um, and there's this uh, diving championship, which happens. And we have like a, a 10 meter board um, concrete structure and, as the uh, swimmers were moving up the stages of the board, they um, practice the rotations and the moves that they are gonna be doing when they finally get to the top level and they throw themselves off. So you can see that process of um, visualizing the dive on the different levels before they actually arrive at the top board and, and, and um, do the dive. Um, off. So I was kind of interested in um, the, the film, the film actually sort of captured that entire process in, in one sort of go. Um, this is about, this was, um, uh, we had a ma magician that was brought to uh, Cognovo and I filmed this magic trick and I wanted to um, film the point where the magic happened, where the where basically the sleight of hand is happening, um, so the the you know the distraction that's kind of happening um, to disorientate the, the the participant, and that's kind of so I slowed down that sort of moment where the <laughs> where the magic sort of appeared. So there was these kind of films that were um, very experimental, like I, I I guess, but really sort of pulled out. Um, different aspects of, of cognition. And then, um, so uh, then I was asked to help um, a live TV um, production of the Cell GP event in Cows. Um, and I was filming from a helicopter and we were chasing racing boats. Um, and my job was to place the graphics over the live footage. Um, and this is a kind of this is a type of large scale film production which requires you to work um, symbiotically with the pilot and the air traffic control and the producer, and you have to 
um, really consider where the wind direction is because you you can't put the helicopter in 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 the way of the sails to block the wind. Um, and then you're also staying within the signal of the radio transmitter. So it's a very, very different form of filmmaking um, where really you're, you're kind of thinking about the technological meshwork. Um, and this was something that really, really interested me for my, for my PhD. So I was getting closer to kind of formulating questions um, and thinking about, um, how my film, all the different types of film experience that I was having had led me to a sort of range of questions. And these questions were really about how and where technological photographic practices, where, where decision-making is deferred in that meshwork and, and who or what is making the decision in the photographic moment um, and how much agency we've given up to automated functions on the camera um, and what the consequences of this. Um, and these are the questions that kind of drove my curiosity to look at all different kinds of technological and, and filmmaking networks. And, and the thing is, you kind of have to ask yourself when you're asking, when, you, when you're having these experiences and you're creating things, at some point you obviously need to stop and look at the range of things that you've made and understand like what are the questions that are driving me now and what are the questions that are important and why are they important? And for me, I was kind of thinking about, there's an overwhelming majority of images which are now made by machines for other machines. And humans are barely in that loop. And we, in, in that kind of shift from analog to digital technologies, um, there came this sort of shift for fame, favoring the image ahead of text as a, a communication tool. So, with images that are now sort of being the fundamental unit of measurement when, you know, when automated functions have, have gradually sort of de decentralized the human and the machine, you know, is becoming ever more ubiquitous. People are not able to decipher these images and their, you know, and their lives are sort of becoming a function of them. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, when through, if you think about the history of cameras, we started looking through eyepieces and then all of a sudden the eyepiece dis disappeared and we had a scream and we've become more and more distanced from the camera. And now we have surveillance cameras and body cam body, body have cameras and our phones have cameras, but they only have, um, that data is only kind of made available to us at certain moments in time. And then it disappears as data again and it's fed between machine, you know, machines are reading these, uh, having exchange of that data between them without us being in that loop. So, um, you know, so not to become too pessimistic about it, but really sort of wanting to know like who or what is making decisions now in terms of that, that the exchange of images and who are taking the images. Um, so, you know, photography and film that is not really strictly a medium in the artistic sense anymore. It's also, represents a sort of communication system where we're, we're sort of becoming more and more distanced from it. So um, my, the work of my thesis really was to open up a discussion of the effects of this shift and the weight of agencies and particularly problems about authorship, um, accountability, responsibility, the ethics, um, using the image as material evidence um, and um, the, I guess the consequence of explanation of caus causality when technologies change in ways that realign the work of the human in that. So anyway, that's, uh, that was my, my PhD. Um, and after the PhD, it kind of is in, it's sort of interesting. It, you, for a lot of people, their PhD sort of just, like it goes to the examiners and then two people read it and it goes on a shelf but I was really really interested in the application of the things that I'd learned and how they could be applied um in 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 the real world really um and when I was reading the overview of the uh horror um description your program description I noticed there was a Chris Davis, um uh, quote, which Chris Ava describes horror as a collapse of the boundaries of self and other. And I thought, 
this was kind of interesting since all the projects I've been involved with after my PhD do exactly this. Um, and they put you in the position of the other and bring um, a certain reality or an extreme event so close to you that you, you know, you kind of experience your response. Um, and we do this through the gamification, simulation, VR, 360 camera technologies. Um, and so one of the things that I was invited to work on um, as a researcher afterwards was to work with um, the medical simulation teams at Torbay Hospital. Um, and this is on a range of projects that looked at the co-design of medical simulations. Um, and in particular, we wanted to look at, um, we wanted to take, um, these are some of the images, um, we wanted to take the reliance away from the clunky sort of robotics of the simulation mannequin, which itself looks like um, a living kind of specimen of object of horror. <laughs> And, and we wanted to see how we could use sort of transmedia approaches to rethink other aspects of simulation training experience by designing empathy and effect and atmosphere and anxiety and tension and offering alternative patient narratives that perhaps conflicted with the obvious presentation of symptoms um, and also factoring in other emergencies into the emergency itself um, because there's this thing called you know, you have to keep people bought in to the um, simulation scenario. Um, so when we felt like clinicians were sort of tapping out of the experience, we, you know, we had to design in other kind of um, emergencies or, or closures or, or kind of problems. So um, if I just flick through, this is like, um, this was a seminar that we did in um, an a and &E acute setting. Um, and we invited seminar participants to experience a type of simulation other than typical emergency response scenario. Um, and that specifically addresses, you know, this one addresses soft skills training. And particularly looking at the stage of a patient pathway through the hospital. Um, so we sort of gamified this, we had envelopes with little pieces of paper, someone's reading it down here, um, and you're basically given a character, a role when you come in and you sit down, um, and you're either with someone who could be one of the mannequins or you're, or you're there as a patient yourself. Um, um, so we intended this simulation to offer a view of medical training that positions you both sort of simultaneously as an impartial observer, but also an active participant. And, um, and we, then, we then, what we did was we ran this scenario where one of the members of the simulation staff, a nurse, um, she acted out a kind of emergency which was happening there and then in the A&E in the, in the room. And what happens afterwards, after any simulation, is that they have a debriefing session. So uh, we also partic participated in the debriefing session. Um, it's a kind of um, space where people can kind of critically reflect upon the procedures and the interactions and the outcomes. So um, I've done a number of these kind of, um, uh, we've designed a number of these kind of scenarios. Um, and this is a typical medical simulation room um, where you have this kind of one way window um, behind the window. You're able to kind of analyze what's going on. And you can also play God by altering the pulse rate or the heartbeat of the of the mannequin um, and and controlling other sort of environmental things and alarms and, and things in the room. Um, and that's also controlled by this kind of a series of screens, which are then used in the debriefing. This video is used in debriefing sessions afterwards. Um, so one of the things that we were also doing was looking at, um, we were looking at some of these mannequins that are used and, and this actually, this is probably Aggie actually in the, in the corner of this picture. <laughs> um, the, the mannequins are, are either designed typically by the aviation industry or they're designed by film studios. Um, and the film studios mannequins tend to be hyper-realistic but have very few functions. Um, at best, they're kind of Risa Sani sort of dolls. 
um, but some of the other mannequins, um, <laughs> uh, they have um, animatronics built into them. Their eyes blink, their eyes, their pupils dilate. They have a pulse. Um, they can sort of urge things. They can, you know, they have sort of physiological responses. Um, but there seems to be this real intent focus on the on the um, fidelity of of the mannequin. So, you know, this this is kind of what we were trying to sort of get away from. Um, and we looked at also how some of these mannequins are taken to other um, parts of the world um, and used in training programs. Um, but there's all kinds of problems around um, shipping <laughs> uh, training materials and objects and 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 tourniquets and um, devices and things to to um, other parts of the world and one of them being this one is a is a is a copy of um, it's, sorry it's a child resuscitation training man mannequin um, and what they've done is they've obviously coloured the skin to make it look like a a black child but of course it's got Caucasian fe features um, so you know we were in discussion about also how we can create tourniquets for children and you know because a lot of these uh, devices are actually for adults but not for um, different kind of frames and builds and um, I've also been working with dentistry because they have different simulation centers where they have these things called phantom heads um, and we've looked at the problem of training dentists to recognize anxiety in their patients. Um, and one of the things that we were working with a robotics team because they thought that it would be useful to design um, a rob an anxious robot, one that might um, glitch or in have involuntary sort of movements. Um, and, but then we realized through, well, I realized through analyzing about 70 hours of uh, dentist patient interaction videos that um, anxiety is distributed everywhere in that dental environment. It's in the music that's playing on the radio. It's in the ergonomics of the chair. If there are no handles, arms, then patients can't hold on to anything. Um, you have some patients that will have uh, physiological problems like Parkinson's disease and they they need to hold a resting tremor um, you have the design of the room the windows the bright lights which are coming into the patient's eyes um, all the other problems of detecting anxiety which may even start before the patient enters the room like how many times they've cancelled their appointment and, and many other kind of things so we were looking at a very um, taking a very sort of ecological approach to to looking at these kind of problems. So um, this leads me to a recent um, project. Now this is um, a little bit of a sensitive case because it's um, uh, something that I've been working with, um, with a forensic expert um, for a couple of years. And, and this came about because um, when I was doing my PhD, I was trying to understand the weight of imagery as material evidence. Um, it's an old problem, it's not a new problem, but I happened to have a chance encounter with a forensic expert. And we um, talked about um, how he uses images in his, uh, in his practice and how do they, does he get them digitally? Are they printed out? How do they, you know, how, how does he manage those images, the weight of those images as, as evidence? And we discussed this in quite length, a long length. And at the time I was working with 360, taking, I was filming hospital simulation environments with 360 cameras and had discussed with him the possibility of using 360 cameras in forensics. Um, to film crime scenes and or to photograph crime scenes and he said that one of the problems that they have in forensics is that he gets a court pack and that court pack will contain all the dna evidence lab data the reports from solicitors from lawyers um, the statements 
discreet photographs of crime scenes, of blood splatter analysis, of DNA profiling, of and all of this stuff comes together in discrete sheets of paper in a literally in a brown envelope. <laughs> it's quite old fashioned. <laughs> um, and sometimes they share they share some of that digitally, but it comes as just individual bits of evidence that and because the forensic service in the UK is decentralized it's no longer a centralized sort of service that's run by the police or the met or whatever it's given out to different kind of agencies the correlation of that evidence and pulling that evidence together is sometimes quite tricky so we were talking about the problems and this is kind of where i'm getting to about forming research questions you've got to understand what are the problems first of all and what intervention can you make um, so um, what we decided to do was to set up um, a kill room um, and to experiment with whether 360, using 360 cameras might be useful in this context. And the first thing I went away and did after the conversation in a pizza restaurant um, <laughs> was, to, was to do some research. Is this already happening? Like, you know, it's 360 cameras have been around for enough time now. Um, is this, has it already been applied to this field? Um, and the thing is, when you get into these kind of arenas, you've got these very long processes of, um, you know, establishing copyright IP, um, validation, accreditation of these processes to be accepted. Um, so, and also the problem of chasing a technology as soon as the technology renews or becomes slightly different you've got to back up the ip the ip has got to to match um or the copyright has got to match the the, the advancement in the technology so you you it's this chasing game um so we set up a kill room in the top of this house <laughs> with the forensic expert we splattered some blood around, some fake blood. Um, and we started to think about how we could pull um, some of this data together and use the 360 image as a data management system to hold some of this evidence. And so we sort of built a prototype and we had a little bit of, I had a little bit of money from Santander Bank. Um, it was just a couple of thousand pounds, but it was enough money to kind of make a prototype, flesh out the questions, couple of visits, train fares up and down and, you know, it's that kind of thing. So, um, and what we realized very quickly that there was, there was value in, in, in doing this. Um, so we, you know, there were ways of pulling, pulling because one of the problems that they have with images as well is that you may get an image from a crime scene and you've got to match it to a particular room and a place in that room. And so you might have this blood splatter, for example, on the wall, but you've got to locate exactly where in the room the blood splatter is. And also you get a piece of paper of some blood splatter, you don't know which way up it is and that's really important for determining um, the kind of locus and the and the and the kind of dynamics fluid dynamic analysis and, and things like that so sometimes the annotations and and the information that's important for the image is 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 apart from the image so you you kind of lose important bits of information if it's not kept together so the problem were, that we identified really was the difficulty of sharing and processing crime scene data efficiently. Um, and the basic research question, I guess, was how might we use 360 imaging as a data management system for forensic crime scene processing? Um, so, oh, okay. What I'm going to do is just take you I go back. What I'm going to do is just take you through um, the recent um, case that I've been working on. 
Oh, and we're here. So let me just minimize that, sorry. So this is a case that happened in September 2020. Um, we, we had this opportunity through Danes. I thought we were kind of building um, business plans and we were going through this process of sort of writing work packages and looking for funding and, and doing everything in a very methodical step-by-step -step process. But the forensic expert that I was working with, I'm lucky that I work with him because he does every part of the analysis. So he works in the lab. He's also analyzes reports. He goes to the crime scene. He, he does the lab work. He, you know, he, he, he does the forensic analysis, everything, and, and also writes the reports and takes them to the court as well. So we had a case that, he had a case that came up that we thought would be perfect for using the 360 technology. And um, we had to clear it through the solicitor and we had to explain to the solicitor that um, this was our first time of doing this, but we, we were almost convinced through the prototypes that we've made that this was going to work and it would be beneficial. And so we priced up the job and we got the, we got the job and it was a case that happened in September 2020. It was an acid attack um, on 11 policemen um, in a lockup in um, North London. Um, the men were under investigation. They were being followed by the police for a number of um, weeks because it looked like they were either money laundering or dealing in weapons or drugs or something. There was a lot of suspicious activity. So um, this is the what happened was the <laughs> they followed the um, the men, the four men, to a lockup in um, in North London, and they decided to do a raid. Um, there were about three, four police vehicles with sirens that came. Eleven policemen came out. They broke through the the front door of the lockup, and the front room, this first room here, kind of looks like a garage. Um, and it looks like a garage with about 11 different types of businesses <laughs> happening in them at the same time. Um, and you come through into this back room here that has no windows and there's a toilet in here. One of the men was hiding in this toilet. Um, another man just outside of it, there were four men in this room. What I'm gonna show you is the live body cam footage of the first, this first policeman that came through the, um, through the door. Um, the thing is when you get these court packs and you get an image like this, there's so much emphasis on these kind of diagrams because it sort of makes you think that a crime scene is static, that people just sit in these areas or stood in these areas, like there's no, that nothing, you know, in, in, in this footage, you realize that the whole scene is moving all at the same time. So to try and understand who threw the acid, who, who did it <laughs> is a very difficult thing to do, but obviously you get these kind of illustrations in the court pack that make it look very simplified. Um, and you have to be very careful and, and critical of um, whatever images that you're, you're given. So if I stop the share and I'm just trying to find, um, the footage. Okay. So this is the body cam footage of the first policeman as he came through the door. Can everybody see this? Aggie, can you see? Uh, not, not yet. I'm just seeing a white square at the moment. But okay. Jackie, we got to cut this out. The video is that. Are we allowed to publish this? Online? I've taken. I've taken <laughs> out. But I mean, yeah, maybe. I'll blur. I'll blur it like in those, like on TV. <laughs> you can't identify anyone. I've okay. made sure that this is the one. So this is the first policeman that comes through. Um, uh 
Okay, so if I just come back just slightly, this is the point at which the acid was thrown. Um, can you see it coming through the air? Um, now, what you have to do is a, a frame by frame analysis of the body cam footage. So this gives you a kind of trajectory of the acid and you can see there's a kind of curve and roughly which direction it's coming from in the room. Um, and this allows you to sort of start mapping coordinates and, 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 and trajectories um, and also positions of the defendants that are in the room. Um, so there are, you know, as you come through frame by frame, you see um, people at the back of the room, the two guys, and they've got their hands in the air. Um, we know one guy is in the toilet at the back here, so he's been discounted. As the policemen come through the room, this guy here in grey has already got both his hands in the air before the acid comes through the air. So we, we know he is now discounted as well. But it still leaves this guy in the corner. And as we come around the corner, <laughs> We see this guy here, and he's rubbing himself with a towel. So he's obviously, he's rubbing the acid off himself. So the tear gas that's being fired obviously creates a lot of smoke in the room. Um, and then it becomes very difficult to determine what's going on. And this is the point that the first policeman realizes that the acid is burning through his gloves. And as you move frame by frame through this, you can see he holds up his hand in front of him and you can see the acid is already burning through the holes in his gloves. I don't know if you can see that. His hand is here. Okay, and he leaves the scene. Sorry, that's quite, it's quite intense. It's quite full on. <laughs> but um, so the problem was we needed to kind of pull all of this information together in uh, building this 360 image um, to pull this evidence together, the body cam footage, um, the the traces, the, the close-up images of the fluid dynamic analysis. And if I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the 360 scene tour that I built. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to share screen with you again. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so. This is the scene tour that um, I built, and it's kind of uh, a basic bit of uh, 360 sort of, um, you, you stitch the 360 images together. So I went to the crime scene, I photographed the first room in three spots and went into the back room and photographed it from, in, from five different positions. Um, but I also wanted to photograph it from the positions of the defendants as well um, to give a kind of perspective, a point of view. So this was the, the first room. Um, so you can kind of travel through the space, but as you map around, you can see, now the hole has been taken out of the wall because the people that come to do the, the fluid uh, analysis and take that away to the lab, literally hack holes into the walls, the, the furniture, and they take out chunks of it and they take it to the lab. And because this had happened a year ago um, and it was an acid, it, it was a corrosive, so it had corroded through um, a lot of the surfaces that it had touched. And when you open these up, 
what you get is um, the UV, the different kind of images that are made by the imaging experts, the police imaging experts, um, so that you can see that fluid analysis much clearer. And what you get when you zoom in is you can kind of sort of start to work out trajectories of the fluid, which angles they've kind of impacted the surface, where they've come through, what the major point of impact, but you also see the secondary marks as well, the, the places where someone has dragged, had the acid on their glove and dragged it through. Um, but it's quite clear when you start looking at these images and you can start reading um, the, the, the fluid dynamics from these images. Um, what was bizarre was there was four garlics and an evil eye over the front door. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> and then we come through into the space and this is the scene itself. Um, and what I try to do is give the perspective of man B in the corner. So you can see, you can look around from his perspective. Man C in this corner, this was the guy that was wiping the acid off his hands with the towel. Um, and what it does is it gives you an idea of the position of people in relation to these acid marks on the wall. And is it actually possible that man C or man B could have thrown it from that position when you're looking at these acid marks on the wall? And when you also turn around, you start to see areas of the wall which has less marks on it. Um, and you can see where perhaps the body would have taken the bulk of the acid splatter rather than, um, so there's kind of outlines of, of, of the people kind of on the wall where the acid hasn't able to been able to kind of hit it. So really it was about a very simple sort of data management system using this 360 imagery um, and how we could hold this evidence together. And it gives um, a spatial orientation for people to kind of understand that crime scene very quickly and the placement of other objects and other people in relation to each other in that, in that scene. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna stop that share. How are we doing for time? Got about 10 minutes. Okay, <laughs> I don't wanna lose you. <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. So, I'm, I'm thinking Jackie might have just accidentally logged herself off. <laughs> Wait, I'll see if she, I'll send her a text. It's so amazing though, isn't it weird how the, the body camera footage really looks like a computer game like I mean maybe it's just because that's what I I recognize it like it's a computer game almost I don't know if any of you felt that as well but it's amazing oh here she is Oh, very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll go back to the presentation again. So really what I was trying to, I was just trying to sort of explain, you know, through all this research that you, you, you kind of, <clears throat> what you end up doing with just sort of like, particularly if you're practice based is, is kind of looking at, um, what your problems are, first of all, what's the problem that you're looking at? Um, and really this is kind of how I came about sort of crafting um, research questions. Um, and I've kind of written this out as a step-by-step -step guide. I don't know if this is helpful. Um, can you see this, the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just go into full screen. So, and zoom that down. Um, so really sort of identifying your broad problem area, I'm guessing most people here have a previous practice and it's practice driven. Um, 
and practice-based research will already have uncovered these kind of specific niche areas or a field of interest or a, a hunch or an inquiry. Um, and really for practice-based, I guess it should be an original investigation um, in order to gain new knowledge about something. Um, and partly this is done through practice or, or as an outcome of practice. Um, so, oh. I've written this out as a PDF, by the way. So just in case uh, you don't feel you don't need to do any screen grabs or anything. Um, so identifying a practical or a theoretical research problem. So that might be a speculative problem, a practical research problem, a theoretical research problem. Um, and what the specific issue is and the difficulty, the contradiction or the gap in knowledge. And you'll be aimed to, uh, you know, you will aim to address this in your research really in your inquiry. Um, and what it really requires is for you to be sort of open and curious. Um, and I think, you know, there is this, in, I know in my own practice that I've kind of, I, I go about with this slight sort of blind spot that I'm trying to diagnose. But what I do is I just keep on working, keep on doing and making these things. And gradually as you, analyze what you've made and you understand you, you're sort of refining that kind of interest as you go and understanding what the problems are. Um, and really, you, you know, that, ref, that constant refining is getting closer and closer to the problem and you have to find out what is known about the problem and pinpoint what exact aspect of the res your, your research is going to address. And, and making sure there's enough literature available to provide a strong basis for your own research. And so these are some, some I thought quite interesting um, and quite valuable sort of questions really about the current situation. Who does the problem affect? How long has it been a problem? What research has already been done? And has anyone come close to the solution? And what are the current debates around the problem? What do you think is missing from them? And my supervisor, when I told him about my idea for the forensics um, issue, he said, well, there's this, been pro there's this problem in aviation about the wheels burning out on aeroplanes when they hit the tarmac. And they did millions and millions and millions of pounds of research about how to avoid this problem. And he said, in the end, it was cheaper just to let the wheels burn out on the tarmac. <laughs> I thought that was just a really defeatist kind of, um, you know, perspective on, on, you know, there is a problem, how can we solve it? Or do we just let the problem just continue? Um, and I think really you just, you know, by asking yourself these questions, you, you're not driving yourself into a cul-de-sac. Um, you're, you're making sure that what you, you are researching is valid and relevant and solid. Um, and so, um, you know, what aspects are you, are you able to attempt to solve and, and what will happen if the problem is not solved and who will benefit from resolving that problem? And for me, that's kind of, you know, when you move out of research, you have to start thinking about stakeholders and customers and future researchers and, and, and um, yeah, the, the, the implications of what you're trying to do become um, uh, yeah, more consequential, I guess. Um, so now we're getting closer to the problem. You have to find out what is already known about the problem and pinpoint the, the, the exact aspects of your, uh, sorry, the, sorry, I'm getting to it. <laughs> when you've designed, the, divine, uh, defined the problem, you need to craft your research question. And this will take a few attempts. And really what you need to do is use others as a sounding board and I guess that other is kind of me, but other people, your, um, your peers as well is also really useful. Um, and, and keep in mind exactly what you want to know and how it will contribute to resolving the problem. Test and validate, and this is kind of useful, where once you've crafted your first attempt, use the lens below to test and validate your research question. Um, so you're focusing on a single problem, is it researchable using primary or, or credible secondary resources, feasible to answer within the time frame, 
and specific enough to answer within the word count, because I know you have 350 words for this, for this uh, piece of writing. So is it complex enough to develop your answer within the word count and relevant to your field of interest? Um, and again, repeat step six and seven, because refining research questions, um, it's a constant process and, and it's best um, kind of fleshed out, like I said, between talking it out, speaking it out, refining it, writing it down, refining the question, you know, writing lots of questions, refining, refining, refining. Um, so yeah, let me stop that share. I think we're out of time, aren't we? We've kind of got to the hour. So, I mean, I hope that's that's valuable. I mean, we do have Aggie, I'm wondering if you could share the document on the referencing, because yeah. I know we've been um, asked to look at the, um, is everybody familiar with Harvard referencing? Yes. Yeah. I'm taking that as a as a yes, but in any case, um, whatever you write in academia, um, it needs to be referenced. It has to be referenced. You need to cite your sources in the body of your work, and you need to write a reference list. Um, it's so important. Um, plagiarism is absolutely not accepted in academia. You have to, it's gracious, it's, it's um, yeah, to acknowledge where your sources have come from, but also to recognize that sometimes our ideas aren't original, they've come on a trajectory, they have a history and you're, you're building on prior knowledge. Um, so, this referencing list, I believe Aggie is on the website somewhere. Is that yeah. right? So this is this is like when you're doing your writing, this is your Bible for referencing. So this is the uh, University of the Underground referencing system. This is downloadable on the website. Um, so when you're doing your work, like this is when you share your writing with Jackie and I, we can help you a bit with referencing anyway but this is um, a really great resource to look at like how to format your references yeah, yeah. so it should give you every kind of permutation of every option um, you know if it's come from a book if it's come from a website if it's come from a journal if it's come from a podcast if it's come from a radio show if it's come from a conference if it's come you know there are a myriad of different sources um, that you'll be using. Um, so it's quite a comprehensive um, document um, that gives you very clear examples. Um, but what we will do when we have the tutorial sessions is to look over the references just to make that they are make sure that they are consistent um, with the document with the with the style that's that's been given to you. Um, yeah. And also like it, it's, it's actually like Jackie was saying, it's gracious on one hand to like reference people and, and good to do that. But also it actually puts your work in the context of other like-minded people. So you're exactly. positioning yourself amongst these other people who've done this work. So actually it's good uh, for you to contextualize your work amongst like these newspaper articles that you've read that are relevant and things like that. So it's also, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's cool too. <laughs> so there was, I mean, I've, I've have mentioned this to, to Aggie. Um, I'm not sure if it's something that people are already doing, but there are um, plagiarism checkers that universities do and Scriber, I think do one, um, there's different ones online where you can basically upload your essay or your, your piece of writing and it can check your references. What it does is it pulls out references and it sort of says 11% of your text is references. We've found these references in these texts on these websites online or these papers online or these journals. Is that right? Have you, so what you can do is you can track across this reference has come from this site. Is this reference right in my list of references or has it come from somewhere else? Is it? Because sometimes they're, they are references 
cited in secondary sources. So wherever possible, it's always best to go to the primary source, but sometimes, you know, there is a bit of a, a secondary um, uh, a source that you kind of have to, you know, you have to reference all of them, both of them. Um, that's something we can look at anyway uh, in the tutorial sessions. So um, we, we can just check over that and make sure that it's, it's, kind of, it's sound. Um, yeah. Is that okay, Aggie? Yeah, thank you. We got to the five. Yeah, we've got so far. <laughs> exactly at five. And actually, we have Jennifer here, who's our, our next lecturer. But um, Jennifer, I hope, I hope you don't mind if, if anyone else has any questions for Jackie quickly before we move on. So does, does anyone have any questions or? Thoughts for now? Well, you'll be seeing more of Jackie anyway, so she's going to be coming in for, for some tutorials and things. Um, again, please, please download the, the PDF of the um, referencing from the site. Jackie, if you, if you wouldn't mind sharing your last few slides, that would be amazing to put on the website as well, if you're happy for us to do that. That would be yeah. wonderful. That's fine. That's fine. I have it as a as a PDF. I know it. I know it's very yeah. Just kind of step one, step two, <laughs> but it's helpful. It's helpful to 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 make sure that you're constantly sort of refining these these problems into questions or turning problems into questions. Mm. Um, it's a good place yeah. to start. Okay. I think as well. Maybe so. One thing to mention before you go. I think it's such an interesting take on horror that like. You know, uh, when you disappeared for a second, we were talking about how the video really resembles like a video game. And it's kind of interesting that like this thing between reality and fantasy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uncomfortably close. Yeah. Yeah. And because I've done loads of simulation, different types of simulation scenarios as well. You. Yeah, it's it's sometimes incredibly hard particularly when you're sort of seeing it through a mediated sort of version of it as a as a video or a, a reconstruction then you you are um constantly questioning um what you've already seen before like you've almost witnessed this thing before so you, you you're not getting the same kind of reaction that you might <laughs> might do if you were there but yeah mm -hmm. it's um yeah could I ask one other question before you go? <laughs> Sorry, but you've so you've you've come from this background. You know, you showed us some of your previous work, but yeah. you've how do you get in touch with these people from all these interesting different backgrounds? Like, what do you? <laughs> ha, what's the? Is there a recipe? How, what do we do? <laughs> Just get yourself out in the world. <laughs> talk to people yeah I mean every time I've met someone it's been through a complete chance encounter and I don't know if that's just because I've I mean I was doing once I was doing a work a piece of work where I was trying to model of cloud and I got on an airplane and I was just doing a small internal flight and happened to sit next to a cloud scientist and it was really, really bizarre and asked him, do you have a scan of a cloud? Like, is there such a thing? He said, oh, yeah, we've got a LIDAR scanner that's on the front of an airplane and da, 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 I can send it to you. It was like, great. <laughs> and then got this thing modeled. And then the forensic scientist was just through a friend and who got invited to a pizza restaurant and, you know, we're just kind of chatting. So I think that's the thing, like, if you're prepared to kind of be open and inquisitive and you're... And I just sort of, yeah, I'm sorry, there isn't any recipe, but I think just asking questions and listening and um, putting yourself, yeah, just even when you're in working in the hospital, I made, it's not always the biggest people, the policy makers and the people writing the strategy that are uh, the most interesting. It's the people that are doing the behind the scenes work that are, uh, you you glean you can also glean as much information from so being putting yourself in situations and listening and mixing with people getting out and so on. but also being quite um, um, 
not being meek about doing that as well. I think sometimes as a woman, you're a bit like, oh, you should, you know, <laughs> but not being meek, not, not making excuses for, 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 for standing back, you know, asking questions and, and being forthright about it. I think it's sort of, um, yeah, you, you need to know what you need to know for your research. So contact the big cheeses if you need to. <laughs> and also talk to the people on the ground. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have any quick fix answers, but that's my approach. <laughs> and it sort of works. <laughs> well, yeah, Paul, Pauline, what one of our researchers met a collaborator on the train yesterday. So I'm starting to think public transport's actually a very good. Public transport <laughs> is good, yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was amazing. Oh, sorry, sorry. The sound went funky. Sorry, I'm on two screens uh, because I, my camera was not working on my computer. But yeah, I met someone yesterday in the in the train. It was super funny to actually. It was like the person read read uh, right next to me, so it was super funny. We talked uh, about the uh, anatomy and this kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's great. I think those coincidental, you know, conversations that you have. Um, yeah, it. I think because also we all take our work, we're never not working, are we? Like, I think as artists and, and makers and designers and things, you're always kind of looking, you're observing, you're always witnessing, you're always absorbing stuff. So, um, it's never going to be uh, you're clocking off. Um, and I think that's when, you know, quite often it's when you're sort of just doing your mundane stuff and having coincidental sort of conversations or mixing with people that, you know, you, you the information sort of comes at you. you. You're sort of absorbing, you're open to it. But yeah, sorry, no real recipe for it, just other than that. <laughs> I don't think there's any hard science. <laughs> oh, Jackie, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, pleasure. Great. Yeah. Can I ask quickly um, if we're running out of time, maybe um, Jackie could leave her email address and then we can email you if we have any further questions. Yeah, shall I just write it in the chat a moment? That would be great if you're happy to do that. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah. Probably that one's best because the university one sometimes blocks, puts things into spam for some reason. So we'll go with that. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank inviting you so me. Much. Thank okay. you. We'll see you again Thank soon. You.